Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Scott Glenn, Chief Energy Officer with the Hawaii State Energy Office. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, especially our Legislative Energy Chairs, Senator Glenn Wakai and Representative Nicole Lowen, and our great speakers for this annual energy briefing as we prepare for the start of the legislative session. The Hawaii State Energy Office is excited to be joining the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for the first time and putting on this event which the forum has done such a good job of organizing over the years. I'd like to thank the Policy Forum for inviting the Energy Office to be its partner, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute for its support, and Think Tech Hawaii for hosting this event on their platform and making the recording available to all of you and the public on their website and YouTube. During normal times, we would hold an all day or a half day deep dive into the world of energy it was just a year ago that we gathered in the Capitol Auditorium for this event. These days, with COVID-19 and its partner emerging menace, Zoom fatigue, we tried to keep today's briefing to virtual in just over two hours. The fact that it now seems relatively normal to be doing an event like this on Zoom is a testament to our resilience. Please note that this meeting will be recorded. The recording will be made available by ThinkTech on its website and on the Energy Office homepage. As soon as the recording is available, we will post links on our social media for it. There's a lot to say, and many leaders in the energy world have made time to be here to share their experience and offer insights into their thinking on our current situation and how we move forward. 2020 was an eventful year, both in terms of the pandemic and energy. We learned early on that COVID-19 was more than just a healthcare crisis. It is an accelerator and underscored the energy office's role as a facilitative catalyst for Hawaii's transition to a carbon-free economy. COVID-19 forced the Energy Office to reprioritize and adjust our focus on nearly a daily basis to the issues stemming from the pandemic and its effects on energy economics. The Energy Office tackled this challenge head-on while fulfilling its COVID-19 responsibilities with a reduced office budget and workforce. Fortunately, there were no major disruptions to our energy supply thanks to the many energy stakeholders that rose to the occasion. These challenges in turn helped the Energy Office to identify and prioritize our most impactful work to help spur economic development and job creation while continuing to reach for the state's clean energy goals. Among the Energy Office's key achievements in 2020 were working with energy companies to give them timely information as our knowledge grew about the uh, coronavirus. We developed a national best practice for keeping energy workers safe during the early days of the pandemic and worked hard to ensure that mission and business critical energy workers have access to the vaccine. We also met with educators, community members, renewable energy developers, and many others to monitor the progress of projects and to understand their workforce and permitting needs so we can do better to have projects that create good jobs for our residents that our residents have the education and skills they need to get these jobs and can feel proud about how the projects contribute to Hawaii's well-being because these projects are done in a way that enhances our communities economically, environmentally, socially, and culturally. Looking ahead, the Energy Office is working on a number of projects with many of the folks whom you will hear from today. We had no shortage of material when it came to planning this year's briefing. There are some important subjects though that we simply can't get to today like offshore wind, which the Energy Office is working with federal agencies to update resource maps and create pathways for community and stakeholder dialogue. Still though, we have a robust agenda um, with five sessions focused on the state's immediate energy priorities to help support and indeed advance economic recovery. We will be briefed by leading Hawaii legislators, public and private sector energy industry stakeholders, labor unions, and community on today's critical topics. COVID-19 has revealed connections and dependencies in our energy ecosystem that undoubtedly have impacted how all of these entities carry out their mission. The topics on the agenda will allow speakers to share their current situations, challenges, and 2021 solutions to help Hawaii achieve a resilient, prosperous, carbon-free economy. And now I would like to introduce Senator Glenn Wakai, Chairman of the, Senator of the Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development, Tourism, and Technology, to say a few words. Welcome, Senator Wakai, and over to you. Thank you, Scott and Kirsten, for putting this forum together. 
Uh, Aloha and Happy New Year to all of you. I want to just preface my comments that I'm sitting here at the Capitol and outside my window is our protesters. So if you hear all kinds of uh, heckling in the background, hope that's not a testament to what I'm saying, but uh, uh, there are uh, supporters out there on, on Barry Tanya Street. You know, I jumped into this energy space just over two years ago, and I quickly saw the really immense opportunities to leverage renewable energy and diversification of our economy. I also take care of tourism, and we all know that tourism spawns low-wage, service-oriented jobs, and we know that technology creates the good quality jobs of the future, but is heavily dependent upon energy, so we certainly can't diversify Hawaii's, Hawaii's economy without reasonable and reliable electricity. And the more I understand about the energy sector, the more I see there are some obstacles in front of us and hampering our progress. For example, I think HECO needs to be much faster in its interconnections. The AES coal plant is gonna shut down next year and a recent HNEI study shows that unless unicorns save the day, there's a chance we're gonna see blackouts in 2022. There are other advocates out there fighting for limited lands. People want to grow more food. We need more housing. We need more space for economic development. All of these interests take away valuable lands from renewable energy. Oh, and let's not forget the NIMBYs. Remember them? They killed the Nanakuli Wind Project and almost halted the Kahuku Wind expansion last year. And you know, so, some of these issues can be solved through policy, but all of them can be solved with stakeholder support. In my first year as the energy chair in the Senate, I was able to reconstitute the state energy office that an audit pointed out was poorly run. The division had many disjointed parts and outdated mission and dysfunctional leadership. So in 2019, I established it with clear goals and a new chief energy officer. Thank you, Scott, for stepping up. That's something that, we, that should have been done years ago. And speaking of years ago, back in 2015, lawmakers passed the RPS with a goal of 100% renewable energy by 2045. That was in fact a bold statement, but not based on verified research. I recall during the RPS debate, some wanted 100% date to be 2050, others wanted it to be benchmarked at 2040. So the compromise was 2045. To me, that's not the way to create sound policy. It was policy by press release. Hawaii was in a rush to be the first out of the gate. Data would, could have shown that maybe we could have hit that 100% renewable goal by 2030, maybe 2060, but that 2045 date was not based on any kind of factual information. So here we are, 2021, just over 30% renewables on the HECO grid. In the past five years, we've picked all the low hanging fruit and the most difficult years are ahead. I see so many stakeholders with conflicting interests that only support their favorite renewables. Many don't like geothermal, others deplore wind, some don't support biofuels. Isn't the common enemy fossil fuels? Instead, we are fighting amongst ourselves. Hydrogen, and as uh, Scott Glenn pointed out, offshore wind are going to be a necessary part of our energy portfolio. Who's going to stand with them against the headwinds that are sure to come? As players in energy in or we are going to continue to be all over the place because if we're not going to share the same commitment to push back Hawaii's reliance on fossil fuels then we should be truthful to the public and tell them we can only get to say 75 percent renewables and reduce the rps accordingly we're not going to get there with the current atmosphere of hoarding tax credits fabricating delays filing lawsuits and paying no attention to, to the cost to rate pairs we're going to make progress when we set aside our self-interest put our paddles in the water and start heading in the same direction. I'm looking forward to this afternoon's discussion as we can fully understand the state of our energy aspirations, debate differences, take responsibility, and show the world that Hawaii can be energy leaders. Thank you, Scott, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Senator Wakai, for your very powerful message. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Representative Nicole Lowen. Chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. Welcome, Rep Rep Representative Lowen. Aloha, and uh, thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of this. Chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. For those who don't know, this is my third year going into it. So, uh, you know, I worked together with Glenn when we reestablished the um, Hawaii State Energy Office. And, you know, it's great to see you guys working on this forum and all the work that you've done since that time. 
Um, as we start the 2021 legislative session, we're facing a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a climate crisis. And every year we hear new and more urgent warnings from scientists about the pace at which the climate is changing, always faster than anticipated. And as a global community, we have a shrinking window of time to take action in order to avoid catastrophic climate impacts. And at the same time, we know that we must ensure our solutions don't place a disproportionate burden on those already at the bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, our transition to a clean energy economy and a clean transportation economy will be good for public health, for the, for the economy, and will mitigate Hawaii's contribution to the climate crisis. So last year, we um, were working on all these issues, and we had to suspend our session um, you know, right in the middle and lost a lot of, uh, had to drop our work on a lot of bills that didn't wind up passing. And um, you know, now we're gonna be coming back and picking those up again and, and getting back to work. Uh, my committee this year is working on a package of bills to support um, all these goals. We're hoping to establish a statewide goal to decarbonize the transportation sector, starting with the state, transitioning its own fleets, uh, a step which will not only reduce our use of imported oil and keep more dollars in the local economy, but will also translate into savings for state agencies and taxpayers. We are also continuing to support making the adoption of EVs a feasible and attractive option for all of Hawaii's residents by supporting incentives to build out EV charging infrastructure, um, EV ready new construction, especially for workplaces and multi-unit dwellings. We are continuing to increase energy efficiency in the state, again, starting with the state leading by example, uh, by undertaking improvements in state facilities. So we actually passed a bill last session um, that was vetoed, so we're working to come back and address some of the small concerns that were raised to get that moving forward. And we believe there are tremendous opportunities here, both for uh, saving money and for creating new jobs and growing the clean energy sector of our economy. Uh, finally, this session, I think we'll, we'll take up at least consideration of the implementation of a price on carbon, which will align the market with the state's policy goals of 100% renewable energy and a carbon neutral economy and transitioning to clean transportation. So if structured in the right way, a carbon price policy has the potential to put money in the pockets of Hawaii's working families, making them better off than they were before while supporting our transition to a uh, clean energy and a carbon neutral economy. Uh, so I look forward to working together with everyone um, on these panels and on this call in the coming session. And of course, working with Senator Wakai, even though we may not uh, see eye to eye on everything, I think we share a lot of common ground. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Lowen. Uh, we greatly appreciate your leadership and your message. Um, Senator Wakai and Representative Lowen, both are subject matter chairs. We very much appreciate you all being here. Um, please, we hope you do stick around and uh, get to listen to the other speakers. And I think for the audience's information, Representative Lowen will be speaking again also in a few minutes here or a little bit later in the agenda. Um, well, with that, I think we'll move on to our first uh, to our first session. And this is about energy assurance and resilience. Our first session today um, focuses on this. As I mentioned earlier, one of the energy office's responsibilities is to support Hawaii's people, our economy, and our security with the energy system we have today. This is something that the Energy Office is actively working on to build a common operating picture for our energy assurance. The pandemic exposed Hawaii's vulnerability to potential disruptions in the supply and demand of fuel. We learned how demand destruction for jet fuel as a result of COVID-19 closing tourism upset the delicate balance in the product mix among Hawaii's fuel refiners and importers. It's not clear when the demand for jet fuel will return to pre-COVID levels, but our energy system has shown resilience to these changes. We have leaders from Hawaii's utilities and energy companies with us today to explore this topic. Our first speaker is Eric Wright, Senior Vice President and Lead Executive at PAR Hawaii. Eric, could you please start us off? Great, thanks so much, Scott. Aloha, my name is Eric Wright. I'm Senior Vice President with PAR Hawaii. We're the largest uh, supplier of fuels in Hawaii. We serve most of the commercial airlines, the military, as well as the driving public. We also supply fuels to the other panelists here. We operate Hawaii's only petroleum refinery. It's located in Campbell Industrial Park. But most of you probably know us through our Hele and 76 branded gas stations, as well as the Nom Nom convenience stores. 
we employ about 680 people statewide and 300 of these jobs are high paying manufacturing jobs. So very proud of that. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about our business and our commitment to Hawaii. You know, COVID absolutely rocked the fuels business, not here, not only here in Hawaii, but globally. And I want to talk about how we weathered that storm. I also want to comment on the road ahead and how we intend to participate in Hawaii's renewable energy future. As COVID descended upon Hawaii, our first concern was keeping our employees healthy and safe. Most of you have probably seen the large ships moored off of Barbers Point. What you may not know is that each of these vessels requires that two of our employees go out to bring the ship in and uh, those guys live on board the ship for several days. At our plant in Kapolei, we have a highly trained team of experts who ensure that we can safely produce fuels in an environment that calls for high temperatures and high pressures. Finally, we have a team of people that move, store, and truck fuels to customers on Oahu, as well as the neighbor islands. Each of these people play a critical role in keeping the lights on, keeping the planes flying, and moving vehicles throughout the state. I'm really proud of the way our team rose to the challenge. We implemented protocols to ensure we could work safely in these close quarters. We also started COVID testing in advance of the state requirements. Last August, we faced a particularly unique challenge. Every four years, we have to shut down our plant for about a month to conduct safety inspections and essentially do a tune-up on all of our processing equipment. This is a $30 million effort, and it involves bringing in 700 contract workers from the mainland and another 150 local contractors. I'm pleased to report that during this period, we didn't have a single positive COVID case. Great accomplishment. We were in constant contact with state and local official, officials about this effort and bring in folks from the mainland. And I wanna particularly thank the State Energy Office as well as the Department of Health for all their support in ensuring we could carry out this mission critical job. I mentioned that this was a $30 million project. It was pretty uncomfortable to be making such a large investment in the midst of a pandemic. But this was a major statement by our company that we're committed to Hawaii. We also couldn't have done it without the support of our key customers like Hawaii Gas and Hawaiian Electric. And I wanna give them a big mahalo for their support. COVID hit our business really hard. Um, if I could point you to the chart in the slide, uh, on the orange line, you'll see uh, commercial jet demand in Hawaii. And essentially 80% of that demand evaporated in a two week period in March, it's very dramatic. Further, the market price of that fuel fell below the, the cost of the raw materials to make that fuel. So we had negative margins on the oil we were bringing in. We had to dramatically shift our business in a short period of time in order to survive. We idled our Par West units, that's the old Chevron refinery, and effectively redirected our what we would make as jet fuel into uh, fuel for the utilities. Unfortunately, we had to lay off some folks, uh, but we were able to keep this to a pretty small portion of our workforce. Uh, this is painful, but uh, this, these are some of the, the tough calls that you have to make in, in periods like this. If you look back at the chart on the right hand side, you'll start to see the recovery take hold and we think the worst is behind us. We're really optimistic about the next 12 months. You know, we were nimble when COVID hit and we will be nimble in adapting to our, our business to Hawaii's future. Climate change is one of the great challenges of our time and we wanna be part of the energy mix here in Hawaii for decades to come. We recently joined the Sustainability Business Forum of Hawaii Green Growth and we're looking forward to being an, a leader in their initiatives. You know, we think of ourselves as an energy company, not as an oil company. For several years now, we have imported a biofuel, corn-based ethanol from the mainland, and we've been honored to be associated with Pacific Biodiesel in the past. We are actively looking at opportunities to supply additional biofuels to the market in Hawaii. We're here today to be part of the dialogue and the solution, mahalo. Thank you, Eric, and perfect timing. Um, we greatly appreciate your, uh, your remarks and being here. Um, our next speaker is Alicia Moy, CEO of Hawaii Gas. Welcome, Alicia. Thanks. Great. <laughs> um, aloha, everyone. It's really great to be part of this panel today, especially on such an important topic for our state. Energy assurance and resilience for me really came to light when the pandemic hit and tourism shut down. We're always thinking through and planning out contingencies at Hawaii Gas to ensure reliable supply to our customers. And all of that has been tested during this pandemic. 
Another area that has really come into focus is the community's reliance on us. One example of what happened right before Christmas, we received an urgent call from a condo building. Their gas supply was empty and their supplier was not responding to them. Elderly residents and families faced a holiday without hot water or the ability to cook. We responded quickly. Our teams were able to get an emergency supply to them, to the building. And I just wanna share this social media post of a resident which really brought it home for all of us who said the quick actions from our company turned our miserable holiday into a festive one. So for us, this was a real win for all of us and for the, the people in the condo building. And, and that's just one example of, of many. Um, with or without a pandemic, that's our job. We know that to put our community and our employees first ensuring that those who rely on gas are not left behind. When the pandemic first hit as a company, our primary concern was to immediately put the necessary safety protocols in place to keep our customers and our employees safe, suspending disconnects and setting up payment plans for customers before it was required. And of course, working with our restaurant customers as they pivot their business to highlight, highlight what they're doing and also encourage takeout. Um, as an energy sector, as you just heard from Eric, we all had to adjust quickly when COVID hit. Given we purchased the bulk of our supply from Par Refinery, we had to coordinate closely with them on a real-time basis as, as with the Hawaii State Energy Office. Conversations were happening throughout the chain of command as we all adjusted our supply to manage the significant fall off on demand. Our teams worked well together to manage the ever-shifting supply and demand needs as we kept our pipeline balanced despite the frequent business shutdowns. We stood at the ready to pivot to our backup contingency plans, which we had established pre-COVID to account for dramatic swings, ensuring that supply was always adequate to demand and that no adverse action was necessary. And why is this important? Well, if there is excess supply without demand, this could require flaring or output, which we knew was not an option and we were able to avoid. So with the exception of the Pearl Harbor bombing, Hawaii Gas has never suffered an outage in over 100 years. And I am very happy to report that that record still holds despite the challenges of the pandemic. And I just also wanna comment on the amazing resiliency of our employees. Our team is already used to operating in emergency situations like hurricanes and such, but as we all know, this has been an unprecedented situation and our employees really met this moment and I'm proud of all of them. And like all businesses in Hawaii, our business has seen been significantly impacted by COVID. We saw an immediate and dramatic hit to our business, losing 40% of our usual commercial customer demand due to the shutdown of tourism and restaurants. We did see a modest increase in business from our residential customers, largely because of the work from home environment. And many of our customers are almost completely reliant on gas for hot water and cooking. And it was our priority that they have the service they need. Regarding our workforce, we have, um, we have uh, 350 employees across the state. Many of them are primary income providers for their families. Our focus was to maintain our workforce without any furloughs or layoffs and instead offsetting those costs by cutting other expenses to the bone. We're proud that we're not further deepened, we have not further deepened the state's unemployment and economic issues, which we know are vast. Regarding carbon neutrality, the pandemic has reminded us that we have to think big think to the future and plan accordingly. And while managing the economic and health challenges, we are continuing to move forward with our work to establish affordable and sustainable pathways for carbon neutrality. And while we are a very small producer of greenhouse gas emissions, we remain committed to do our part to decarbonize. Our clean energy transi transition must and is continuing. And so to wrap up, we know 2020 hit hard and recovery will be slow. Hawaii gas experienced turmoil unlike anything in our history. We've had a few sleepless nights, um, just keeping supply in check with our demand. I'm, I'm really proud of our employees' resilience and our company's ability to keep all of our people employed and our continued focus to find new and innovative solutions to these extraordinary challenges of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, we appreciate you making time for the presentation today. Um, next, we now have David Bissell, CEO of the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. Thank you for joining us today, David. Thank you, Scott, and aloha to everyone. Well, from the start of this crisis, KAUC worked very closely with our Kauai State representatives and uh, Senate President Kochi, State Energy Department, PUC, Department of Health, and Kauai County. And I really want to give a big uh, mahalo to all of those because that coordination really helped us weather the COVID storm so far, and we're optimistic we will through the duration of it. From uh, the start in March of 2020, 
KIUC focused on three main areas regarding COVID, safety of our employees and customers, reliability and financial stability. A few highlights on what we've done. Um, immediately after the uh, quarantine started, we shut down all member service, walk-in customers, which for us as a nonprofit co-op was a pretty big deal. Um, as many as 20% of our customers were coming into the office every day and just like that flick of a switch that was done. So a lot of uh, technology was put into play instantly and under pressure. And I think we can all say the our IT people, really the unsung heroes of the COVID transaction uh, um, situation. Without those, our businesses simply wouldn't have survived. And it's really amazing how quick we all were able to go to a remote environment and, and keep functioning well. Um, our members use new technology. They shifted to our Smart Hub program, 30% increase in use of that right away to, to help pay their bills. Um, our linemen and power plant employees all changed the way they operate and work together to increase safety. And I think all of us were really worried about the guys in the control room initially that, that we could have huge impacts from uh, an outbreak. And we had a uh, have had no impact in our control room. So really another shout out to our employees, the employees following uh, directions and often changing situations really helped out. Um, sales decreased for KIUC year to date about 10%, started off 15 to 20% down. And we worked really hard on the financial side right from the start. Um, we were fortunate having our smart meter technology that allowed us to know from day one how much they were down. So we worked on debt restructuring. We worked with the commission on some um, deferring of uh, revenue lost and we were able to weather the storm financially. Um, reliability 2020 was our best year ever. A lot of that's because of new technology. The uh, um, battery storage technology we have out there. Batteries are now our single biggest uh, generator if you combine them and they really help keep reliability up. Looking forward to the new year, our, our West Kauai Energy Project was just announced. That's an innovative battery, um, hydro pump storage and uh, PV all, all linked together on the west side. A lot of the viability of that project is based on tax credits, both federal and for this audience state. Um, it's, Bill, uh, Senate Bill 2820 passed last year, kept the uh, state tax credits for pump storage technology, and it really helped uh, make that project financially viable. So we want to thank everybody for that. Um, also, we brought our PMRF battery and PV project online at the base, which is a microgrid technology, and it's just about fully functional right now. So the base's security will improve. So thank you very much for the time and appreciate the opportunity. Great. Mahalo, David. Thank you for uh, your insights. Um, up next is Scott Su, CEO of the Hawaiian Electric Company. Aloha, Scott. Aloha, Scott. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for um, allowing me the chance to join all of you and talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of a recap of 2020. Uh, but I also, most of my remarks, I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, resilience and energy security. So like David just uh, covered, you know, from an operating utilities perspective, 2020, as we had to, you know, really adjust to COVID and the pandemic, uh, first and foremost, it was about keeping people safe. You know, as, as you may imagine, if you have an employee who is uh, sitting in a control room and you only have a certain handful of those critical employees, those are the types of employees that are most, um, uh, well, <laughs> I will say this, those employees are way more valuable than the president and CEO to keep the lights on. And so, in, in our mindsets, we had to make sure that we were doing what we could to keep our operations employees uh, safe. Um, for the most part, those are the types of employees that have to keep coming into the office and do their, do their work at the power plants. Um, of course, we have our transmission and distribution crews. And it was really about coming up very quickly with measures to keep those critical employees safe um, as we work through the year. About half of our employees were able to very quickly switch to remote uh, remote working. And again, our IT group, uh, I would say they are the unsung heroes of, of the pandemic. Uh, very quickly, all of us shifted to getting used to Zoom and WebEx. And yes, we all have a little bit of fatigue, but by and large, I think we're all getting, getting better at, uh, at managing through that. So let me shift a little bit more towards some of the ongoing resilience and um, energy security 
uh, issues that we that we face today and we probably will continue to face going into the future. So as you see on my slide, um, really one of the most important things to always think about is that we in the energy world, we are all part of one big supply chain. When you think about the end kilowatt hour getting to the customer. So in this case, I mean, just look at the representation on our panel here, starting from Eric's uh, uh, par, you know, we do have, still have uh, fossil fuel in our system, right? And to the extent, like Scott mentioned earlier, that there may be a disruption to that supply, that is something that we all had to immediately jump on top, working it with Eric and, and the folks at PAR, uh, with uh, State Energy Office, with our Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Uh, difficult decisions had to be made, but uh, ultimately, you know, people had to come together and we did come together. The other parts of the supply chain now are also on our renewable energy side. So as we work with independent power producers, more and more we are also working with our customers who are supplying a significant and growing portion of the renewable energy that we use in the Hawaiian electric system. So all up and down this chain, it's critical that we think about energy assurance, energy security as we are rolling those resources out as we are implementing new programs um, because ultimately you know it, it gone are the days where we had a very centralized everything under the utilities control or perhaps just a handful of small of large businesses controlling the entire supply chain we have essentially gone to a a situation where we have thousands frankly thousands of different supply resources all playing a role in our energy system, and that's actually going to just increase as we go into the future. Um, there are not going to be any silver bullets when it comes to addressing these challenges, uh, and it's just because we have such a diversity of resources and a diversity of, of needs um, and a diversity of threats, by the way. We have the natural disasters, of course, that we're all very familiar with and we've responded to over the course of the years. Last year, we uh, knock on wood, dodged a bullet with Hurricane Douglas uh, uh, narrowly missing us. Um, but then also we have growing threats coming from the human side. Cybersecurity is, is growing. Uh, in May of last year, the federal government issued an executive order uh, through the Department of Energy that really shines a spotlight on transactions dealing with Chinese-made equipment. And uh, we are actually under, we, we fall under that executive order because we provide power to some very, very critical federal facilities here on, on this island. Um, all that to say, this is a variety of threat vectors, as they say in the business. I'm, 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 when I say vector, I always think of either math or a, or a rat. But uh, in any case, these are the variety of things that are challenging our energy system as we go forward and transform it. One last thing, community engagement is absolutely critical. And ultimately, we can't force fit what the, the, the operations guys think are the best solutions into the communities. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You raised some very important points. Um, I just want to make a quick reminder for the audience that the slides that you've seen here will be available on our website um, and with the recording later when it becomes available. Um, so I think at this point, uh, we've heard from four really great speakers on our energy security side. Uh, Mitch, I'd like to turn it over to you uh, for any questions that we might have. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Scott, and uh, hello, everybody on the panel. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions uh, that uh, I think apply to all uh, four of our panelists. So I'd like to start off by saying, you know, what, you know, if you look in the near term, like right now, what's your most challenging challenge? And uh, the other part of that question is, how can the legislature help you address that challenge? So um, after all, we are speaking to legislators today, and uh, you know, I think um, we, we need to ask them how they can help us. So I'm gonna start off with you, Eric. Can you uh, kind of uh, identify one of your biggest challenges and, and, and how the legislature might be able to help, help you uh, address your challenge? Yeah, um, thanks, Mitch. Our our business is obviously very sensitive to economic conditions in Hawaii. We sell fuel, so when people fly here and rent a car or uh, fly home, uh, they're using our fuel. 
and um, and so you know, so it's really all about positioning our business to make it through this difficult period and enjoy the good times that are sure to return at some point. Um, in terms of specific asks for the legislature, I, I wouldn't say that we have any any particular ask. I, our interest is really um, in policies that help our customers. And so uh, policies that help uh, restart the, uh, the tourism economy, uh, create jobs, address the cost of living, um, the things that are good for our customers in, in Hawaii generally is, is good for us. Okay, thanks very much. So Alicia, how about Hawaii Gas? You have one of the biggest challenges in my opinion, I'm not gonna talk for you, but you know, trying to convert the gas uh, company to decarbonize I think is like a huge challenge. So, but getting back to my original question, so what, what are your immediate challenges and how do you think the legislature could help? Yeah, it's a great question right off the bat. Um, you know, the immediate challenge is really working through what COVID is going to have, what effect it's going to have for the this 2020 one year. Um, we've been doing, looking at various forecasts for the recovery and what that looks like. Um, obviously for any business, um, that recovery impacts how you allocate resources, allocate capital, allocate capital for projects um, like renewable gas and hydrogen studies and all sorts of things like that. So um, we want to continue to move forward with that. We are committed to do that. It's just working through, you know, those pieces and that challenge of 2021. It's, it's when is it, when is it going to come back and, and managing through the financials of that. Um, in terms of specific ask, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I think we, we benefit a lot from from legislators is, is just an open door. Now it's a little bit difficult because, you know, you can't go to the office, but at least having a virtual open door and the opportunity to discuss what we're doing and ex educate. Um, I think that's, you know, part of the whole process. Um, we're all interconnected here as an energy system and really under, trying to understand how we're all interconnected and how, you know, one policy may impact uh, the whole entire system. What are the unintended consequences of that? Um, and of course, as Eric mentioned, I mean, customers and, and working through how do we, how do we help our, our residents through this? I mean, that is, that is, you know, front and center for everybody. Yeah, thanks very much, Alicia. So David, you've had a really good uh, record of uh, progressing our uh, renewable portfolio standards. I mean, you've got these uh, really good numbers. Um, but the same question to you, like what are your immediate challenges and how can the legislature help you? Thank you. Um, you know, we've got most of the low hanging fruit. We've reached about 60% renewable here. And now, now we're pushing new technology again, the pump storage hydro linked with a large scale PV. And the key part for us from a legislative side, this is a long-term um, difficult project operationally and financially to bring about, but it's gonna be 20, 25% or more of our RPS on that one project alone. And it brings much needed bulk storage technology to our grid, but it is tax credit reliant and, and keeping certainty on tax credits and, and state policy around credits is really essential. We brought in, we're partnering with AES on, on this project. So we're bringing in, you know, large mainland uh, investments to the project, but we got we need to keep the certainty on it or, or projects like that won't be successful and it'll be difficult to attract uh, capital for future projects that are gonna be needed throughout the island chains is, is the RPS moves higher and, and, and getting uh, improvements becomes more difficult. Okay, thanks, uh, David. So Scott, same kind of a question for you. Uh, you know, uh, how, how are you doing and how can we help? You know, I, I think that we, we've got a lot of exciting things uh, happening here. Um, I know, I think Chair Griffin will talk a little bit more about on the regulatory front, uh, recent performance-based regulation uh, order that came out. Um, we have a lot of effort going on, of course, as we're pushing forward with the renewable energy. I, I recognize and acknowledge Senator Wakai's comment about uh, needing to get those interconnections done so that we can get these resources hooked up to the grids, uh, which also ties back to this topic of uh, energy assurance and uh, resilience. But, you know, if, if anything, I would, I would suggest um, that we could really use... Um, more direct dialogue to try and harmonize across a lot of the state policies here, right? We have our state energy policy, um, land use uh, challenges are becoming more and more uh, significant. 
you know, just within the last week, there was a front page article about the difficulties uh, of a project developer trying to develop a, uh, one of our community-based renewable energy solar farms, uh, which would be targeted towards helping low to moderate income customers. But there were concerns raised from some in the agriculture sector about whether the use of that parcel of land was truly better for energy versus food production. So those are just the types of uh, things that we're gonna start to see more and more of as we go into the future. And I, you know, it does get back to that comment about everybody being able to come together and really putting things on the table and really making those tough decisions because uh, uh, otherwise getting to the 100% um, optimally is, is gonna be very difficult. Right, well, we're all in that canoe behind me together. That's for, that's for sure. So I actually have a question about LNG. And uh, the question is, is LNG being considered by the state as a cleaner option to replace coal next year on an interim basis, and perhaps also to meet other energy shortfalls until the state can achieve 100% uh, sustainable energy? So that was kind of level at the state, but could you guys uh, comment? Maybe uh, Scott, you could comment on it because uh, you know, you're, you, you have a lot of uh, generation uh, requirements. I, so. I assume you mean Scott Sue here, right? Um, oh, yeah, so I do. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, we don't actually have any plans right now, um, you know, to, to, to go back to LNG. Uh, a number of years ago, we actually did when, when, when Nextera uh, was one of the uh, uh, folks around town. Uh, we were being quite aggressive at the time, trying to map out a strategy that would be uh, be based on switching over to LNG while we did continue to have any any amount of fossil fuel in the system. Uh, but I can tell you that right now, our plans, we, we don't have LNG uh, as part of our current plans. I don't know, Scott Glenn, if uh, you, you wanna jump in here too. Um, sure, and, and this might be our last question just because we need to be moving on to. Um, I think at this point, uh, Governor David Ige has been quite clear that his preference is not to use LNG and for the state to move on to renewable energy resources as quickly as we can. And certainly the uh, Hawaii State Energy Office is acting in that way and regarding proposals that way. So I see I still have a minute left in our time. So Alicia, this is uh, also a question for you because you, you guys have already been importing at some point, as, at least on a trial basis, uh, LNG. What, what's uh, what, what's your comment about this uh, question? Well, we we uh, have no plans to increase any sort of amount of LNG into the system. We have a limited uh, scale project that we use for resiliency reliability purposes that was approved by the HPUC. That equipment can also be used for renewable natural gas, gas from renewable sources as well. So it is it is it is important infrastructure to have in place for just you know, pointing out the top, whole topic of this panel is energy assurance and resilience. And uh, David Bissell, what, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, we don't, we don't have any uh, movement towards LNG here. We looked at it a few years ago, but we don't have the scale and we've moved so far on renewables that there's no, the scale's even less, so it's not viable for us. Okay, and Eric, you're the uh, importer, the refiner. What's your, what's your comment on that? This is the last. Last question. It's, it's not something we're working on. Well, that, uh, that completes my uh, time allocation for this uh, Q&A period. Over to you, Scott Glenn. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you, everyone. Um, participants, uh, thank you very much for speaking this afternoon. Our second session uh, is to address critical solar pathways to 100% clean energy. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time in the short you know, two or so hours that we have to address all technologies. Um, but we decided that we would focus on solar rooftop and grid scale because that's the critical path to the coal plant. Um, solar PV is the anchor of Hawaii's renewable portfolio. Uh, together, rooftop and utility scale solar account for nearly 60% of renewable generation statewide and ensuring that the deployment of Hawaiian Electric stage one and stage two projects go smoothly is critical to be, uh, make sure that those projects are there and available uh, on time for the scheduled retirement of Hawaii's only coal plant in 2022, pursuant to Act 23, which the legislature passed earlier uh, last session in 2020. Uh, did you catch all that? So uh, 
the Act 23 of 2020 is for the coal plant retirement uh, in uh, next year, 2022. Um, so the Energy Office is also uh, doing community outreach and making workforce development a priority for these projects as they make their way through the development pipeline. For this session, we're pleased to have five speakers representing a wide range of perspectives on this topic. Our first speaker is Rick Rochello, Executive Director of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. HNEI, a research and development arm of the University of Hawaii, plays a critical role in supporting the transition to, rel to reliable and affordable clean energy in Hawaii. HNEI provides independent and impartial research, analysis, and demonstration to inform decisions made by regulators, legislators, utilities, and other energy stakeholders. Take it away, Rick. One more time. I'll uh, make up the time. I want to thank the organizers, State Energy Office and Policy Forum for inviting me today, and uh, especially for providing me an extra two minutes, since my goal is to kind of set the stage for the following speakers, but I'll try to return at least one of those minutes. HNEI and one of its contractors, Telos Energy, have been spending considerable time looking at the high solar scenarios for the islands, and a lot of the focus has been Oahu, and I'm going to really focus on Oahu today as an example. Part of our effort has been develop new tools that provide accurate, transparent ways to analyze what these future grids will look like, ones with much more solar than we have today. As has been stated a couple of times now, these tools are being used to support PUC decision-making, especially in regard to potential uh, reliability issues associated with the retirement of the AES plant. I'm not going to discuss that, but a presentation of that work is available on the PUC website, or you can contact me. In a way of a very short description, these tools analyze every hour of operation on the grid over the course of a year. And what's different about them is they have the capability to consider in a probabilistic manner multiple years of solar data, random unit outages, and to simultaneously look at grid stability. This flexibility, along with the ability to look at different operating strategies for the batteries, gives us, I think, very important information about how to optimize the management of the solar battery systems for the benefit of the entire grid. Um, we believe it's going to provide a number of useful insights, and one that's easy to, to understand is it provides insights into what I'd call extended weather events, and the classic one everybody always remembers is the 2006 40 days of, of rain, and, and it's used as an example, although it doesn't necessarily look particularly bad when you put it into the model. So anybody who's interested in that, I'll be happy to talk about, but I wanted to get to a more general discussion. You know, based on what I've been asked to do, we, we kind of ran this model a few times, making some very optimistic sets of assumptions. So we eliminated a lot of the grid constraints, ability to cycle units, to really just look at the ability of batteries to, to arbitrage energy and put it onto the grid out of a solar system. And again, the focus is, is on Oahu. So the figure that's shown on the left kind of summarizes those results. And I'm just gonna point out a few things from it. First and foremost, and, and I think part of the topic here was solar to get to 100%. Um, as the systems are currently configured, and it can be four hour storage or six hour storage, even without any siting constraints, whether that's rooftop or, or land for utility scale, solar plus storage will not get us to 100%. You know, other non solar generating technologies or maybe some radically different means of storing energy and shifting that energy are going to be needed. That said, if you follow that curve up and you look at the numbers, the PV plus storage as it's currently being implemented and as we see it going forward in the future, can take us well beyond where we'll be even when the stage one and stage two projects are completed. So there is still a lot of room to be able to move forward with solar but somewhere around 70 to 80% of our total energy on the island, curtailment really starts to increase significantly. Additional storage does not easily get you out of that. And so there's gonna to need to be other solutions. You know, coming from that and looking at the numbers on that graph, there's a, a few conclusions we reach. One is that we think we're gonna need both utility scale and rooftop to be fully developed. It's not a contest between the two. We're gonna need both. 
they each come with their own sets of benefits and issues. Clearly, potential transmission and land availability is a problem for utility scale. Rooftop and controls at the edge of the grid are likely to be a limiting factor for the utility scale. So there's requirements to develop both. There's issues that need to be addressed for both. Um, I had a little bit more, but I know my clock is already starting to run down. So I wanted to make just a couple of high level comments. The community via the investment, the rates are making a big investment in batteries. It's very important we continue to look at how to use these batteries to do more than just shift energy, to provide grid services. I think we're well on the way to doing that, but it's important that we minimize the expenditure on unnecessary or potentially unnecessary infrastructure. Um, we've talked a lot about different goals, carbon decarbonization, resiliency. I think there's an opportunity to build those better into our decision making on which projects go forward. And in particular, I'm thinking in the resilience part of it. It's going to be very difficult to retrofit for resilience. We really need to get that upfront as part of what we do. And finally, as a final comment, if we're going to get the broad community acceptance that is required to move forward on all these fronts, we're gonna to need to make sure that the rates that people are paying uh, is a benefit to all the rate payers. And, and that I think can do a lot and explaining that to them and making sure that's in place is gonna be important. So that's quick, I'm glad I had the extra two minutes and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Rick, thank you so much. Um, we greatly appreciate you sharing your Manaho with us. Um, our next speaker is Brian Gold, uh, president of the Hawaii Solar Energy Association. Over to you, Brian. Thank you, Scott. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Hawaii Solar Energy Association is a nonprofit trade organization that represents the majority of the solar companies operating in the state. And those companies are, or our membership is majority uh, locally owned. I thought I'd start by uh, talking a little bit about the, the industry's uh, response to the pandemic. Um, Scott mentioned earlier. Uh, the information that the state energy office did a really great job um, spreading out to the community. And I just wanted to echo that. And, and that in part allowed us as an industry group to provide a comprehensive guidebook to our members regarding safe workplace guidelines um, and providing them with essential resources and how to keep their businesses operating. Um, and this really kept our essential workforce operating safely amongst themselves and in the community. And that was a huge part of the rooftop solar industry um, remaining a main driver of the construction sector uh, throughout 2020. So in contrast to a lot of other industries, we were very fortunate to have a strong 2020. Um, consumer, consumer favorability towards renewable energy has remained incredibly strong in Hawaii. And um, we've been very proud to deliver those solutions to, to the community. Um, regarding our, our workforce, so uh, the Solar Foundation did a study in 2019 that identified that just the photovoltaic sector um, compromised well over 3,500 local jobs. And I think it's notable to point out what that doesn't include. So that doesn't pick up um, some of the accessory business in the solar trade. Um, that would be solar hot water, uh, wholesale distribution, financing, engineering, et cetera. When you add all of that in, uh, we make up about 6,000 jobs in the local economy. And those are diverse. Um, Senator Wakai, made a comment during his remarks about diversification of our clean energy economy. And that's certainly something that we support um, in all of the above strategy. Um, and I would just like to point out that the most successful companies in the quote unquote solar space are quite diversified, um, not just PV and solar hot water, they're installing electric vehicle chargers, split air conditioning systems, LED lighting systems, skylights, solar attic fans. Really the emphasis there is not just on renewable energy production, but it's also on energy efficiency. That's a huge part of the industry. And, and this local workforce that's quite massive has really become a homegrown success story. So Rick in his comments before me mentioned battery technology. Um, Hawaii really stands out nationally now as having the highest attach rate of batteries to residential solar energy systems. Over 75% of 
the solar systems going in now have a battery attached to them at the residential level. And that's dramatically higher than anywhere else in the country and really is a unique resource and something to be very proud of as a state. And so this local success story um, has propelled the rooftop industry um, to be that anchor of the RPS that was mentioned earlier. And we're very proud of that. So the, the biggest challenge we have moving forward is how we go faster. HECO's power supply improvement plan identified um, an estimate for uh, between 1,226 megawatts and 2,537 megawatts of additional rooftop solar required to meet the RPS. Now, to put that in perspective, give it some scale for everyone, the rooftop industry has done about 820 megawatts of solar to date today, so that roughly in the last 20 years. So we need to go two to three times as fast to meet our goals as an industry and for the state. Yeah, I know I'm over time, Scott, just to, to wrap up, um, uh, to echo one other comment uh, regarding market consistency, that really is huge for our industry. Without market consistency, um, investment will leave the state and we really want to continue to promote um, a growing sector of our clean energy economy. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ren Westcote, the Development Director for Long Road Energy. Thanks, Scott. Aloha, everyone. Uh, thanks for sharing time with us this afternoon. Um, I work for Long Road Energy. Uh, we used to be called First Wind, and we developed, uh, since 2005, seven of the state's largest uh, utility-scale wind and solar projects. Uh, I'm here today to talk about utility-scale solar, which is uh, unlike uh, Brian's uh, rooftop projects. These are the projects that are larger projects that are installed uh, on the ground. Uh, together, um, utility scale solar is the lowest cost uh, clean energy and probably the cheapest of anything besides coal. Uh, we will, um, we're replacing uh, coal fired and oil fired generation and uh, utility scale projects over the next three or four years are going to help the state get past 50% renewables. Big chunks uh, really move the needle. Uh, probably over the next few years, you're probably looking at $2 billion in construction activity in the state and at least another 1,000 construction jobs. In terms of uh, challenges, one of the big challenges that several people have mentioned is our state has two priorities. Well, two, two, two priorities, uh, local, locally produced clean energy and locally produced food. I mean, they're both really important priorities for our state. And solar and farming like the same kind of land. So they like flat land with lots of sun and dirt. And so more and more, I think we're seeing uh, solar and uh, agriculture, you know, looking to use the same kinds of lands. And, and that is um, what's important for, um, for us in our industry and for uh, friends in the farming industry is finding uh, ways that we can use that land co-use the land uh, for both purposes. Uh, we need to research compatible crops and livestock. Uh, we were, I worked with a couple of projects that now on Oahu, they're solar projects that are now Oahu's largest sheep ranch, um, but there have to be more things that we can do with agriculture. So we're looking at shade tolerant crops. We're looking at um, uh, pollinator you know, uh, species to improve honey production. We're looking at potentially hydroponics under the solar panels. Um, and growing, uh, you know, and, and other sort of uh, ways that we can use the land for both solar and agriculture so we don't have to sort of create laws that, that cut a land down, you know, cut a lot, set a line down the middle and say solar only over here, agriculture only over here. So that's one of the challenges that we're hoping to work with uh, uh, folks to, to look for new solutions so that we can share the land and, and achieve uh, uh, all our goals. That's it. Thank you, Ren. Uh... Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Um, now I'd like to introduce Eric Enos, Executive Director of Ka'ala Farm in YNI. Eric is a longtime community leader, and we are very fortunate for him to be here with us today. Over to you, Eric. I want to thank you for inviting me. I'm, a, I'm going to represent a community voice. I'm coming from the back of YNI Valley and the, uh, and the speaker before me, and those were very right on mark because we're looking at... Uh, uh, land and and uh, the challenge between farms and solar, and uh, but let me just give you a little bit of background. I'm I'm in the back of Waianae Valley right now. We're a model cities project that started 
many years ago. And we're dealing with social economic issues and working with a community that has many concerns. Getting to our community learning center, we have to go through stolen cars and illegal dumping and um, a lot of uh, illegal activities. And then you come to our area and we've uh, brought back water into the community. Uh, we're farming uh, using traditional agriculture and uh, working uh, to teach, teach the children uh, Native Hawaiian issues and natural resources and environmental and really concerned about economic resources, living wages, uh, small business and cottage industries, and uh, really a holistic approach to um, how do you create strong communities? How do you create healthy communities using using all the, the the tools that we have and energy drives everything that we do yeah for it and uh and i'm looking right here at the wayawa solar farm that talked about uh, uh, uh solar versus um food versus fuel yeah so and 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 that's a perfect example because right now we're working with uh, uh putting in uh sheep for fire control and working on small scale uh energy projects that could that could power small farms throughout our state and throughout our com communities so that's pretty much where we're at so i'm very much in 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 favor of having um working with the developer right from the start in the community so that we can address these concerns and and also the work that uh, that the, your department is doing and in, in getting out into the community before we have we, we get committed to a project so that we can start facilitating the discussion and so that we can really working on both sides of it so it's not a uh, one versus the other but to create some win-win solutions for the work that we're doing so that's pretty much it and that's my 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 role to be part of this process so mahalo and thank you mahalo eric thank you so much um, our next speaker is Damian Kemp, manager of IBEW Local 1186. Over to you, Damian. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. You know, going last is a little tough because, you know, everything I wrote down, you know, a lot of people spoke about it, which is very good. Uh, IBW trains its members through a five-year apprenticeship program, which we currently have around 500 uh, apprentices statewide. They graduate with getting a required State of Hawaii Journey Persons License. Our graduation rate is about 90%. We also have continued education for our over 2,400 journey persons in safety, electrical code book review, all renewables, and ever-changing technology that keeps coming up and changing every day. I also see other programs training for renewables, especially rooftop solar, and these graduates end up receiving a certificate of completion. The challenges and the potential opportunities that we see is that the challenge that that I see with these certificates that are, are, are being handed out, however, is that while it teaches you to install the rooftop solar, it does not allow them to actually go out and start installing panels. You still need to obtain a state of Hawaii electrician's license to do that, which requires five years, 10,000 hours of electrical training. The other challenges that I see that pertains to um, getting work for everyone is um, the approvals of homeowners, uh, contractors, and developers in getting their, whether it be utility approvals for the grid itself, um, being able to get contractors have a hard time sometimes getting permits and inspections to the city. Developers are getting a hard time going to neighborhood boards and obtaining land use permits. And I can understand why in the community is hesitating to approve some of these farms and windmill projects. And the reason for that is because, you know, they're looking at well, if you're going to build it in my neighborhood, what do I get out of it? What is their financial gain? What is their utility uh, bill going to be? Is it going to go down or not? So to me, some of these questions need to be answered in order to you know, move on with a lot of these projects. You know, one, one of the solutions to helping the industry itself is making sure that it's being installed safely and cur uh, correctly, ensuring current laws are being followed regarding license which would involve the state's DCCA, as well as the city and county inspectors. We also need to educate the public on how these great solar projects will better their lives. Rooftop solar is paid by homeowners, so they can benefit, they can see the benefits right away by seeing their lower electricity costs. The same theory needs to go uh, and be echoed out into community with all of these solar farms and other renewable projects. The other big thing that I think, the, 
that will help out in the future as well is that we still need to keep up the state and federal tax credits and rebates that they hand out. Um, I believe we can get to this goal of 2045, 100% renewable energy, but we need to move now. And we need to you know, educate the public on the big picture. Thank you, Scott. Mahalo, Damien. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for your great presentations. It's great to hear from a diversity of stakeholders coming into this from uh, your own points of view about how it comes together in, in one topic like this. It's clear that we're going to need everyone's support to successfully carry out Hawaii's clean energy transformation. Um, I think several questions came in for the Q&A. So Mitch, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Scott. Yeah, I have uh, one question that uh, is, hasn't been addressed in this uh, presentation. The question is, what is the plan for waste disposal 20 to 10 to 20 years from now as solar panels and batteries uh, reach the end of their useful life? So maybe I could uh, ask you, Brian, to start off um, and uh, followed up by maybe Ren. I mean, you're, you guys are dealing with these, you know, um, both of these, uh, both the panels and the batteries. So the reuse issues we face in the rooftop space are probably of a slightly smaller quantity than Wren's, but yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and take it. Um, this has been an interesting space and there's been um, a lot of new companies that have formed specifically to address these challenges. And to date, the most effective uh, means of repurposing them have been through groups like Reuse Hawaii locally. And also there are groups that will uh, collect a certain quantity and they have different minimums and repurpose them to um, low-income countries. Um, we've, we've worked with a company uh, that repurposes to the Dominican Republic, to Haiti, et cetera. And so that's one of the areas I would say in the rooftop space, given the relative youth of the trade compared to some of the other trades, it hasn't been a huge issue, but it's definitely a growing challenge and we're seeing a lot of innovation pop up to address it. Okay, Ren, do you have a comment? Sure, yeah, I think it's, a, it's similar. We are, you know, these uh, solar panels are going to have a useful life of 35 to 40 years or more. So we haven't really hit the, um, the outside of that envelope for some of the projects that have been built recently. But more and more companies are available on the mainland uh, that look at recycling. I think our goal is to first, you know, to re uh, ship the projects out to be reused if possible, as Brian was mentioning. If not, to be recycled, and a lot of the components can be recycled. And then if not, to, to figure out some sort of, for whatever cannot be re uh, recycled, some sort of disposal site on the mainland. Uh, but those are all, that right now, that's all, um, speculative because you know we haven't really gotten there for so much of the volume of the of the pv panels that are out there now okay. um we, we don't have very much time left so we're running over so i'm going to ask eric uh, one quick question eric practically how, how can we bring you know the the uh the farming community and the pv community together to vent or, or talk about these issues and then come up with solutions. And how can the legislature help doing that? Help help us do that. Yeah, you need to facilitate. You, you need a very good facilitator and spend some time uh, talking to people in the community. Uh, you, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one work that has that that has to be done in creating a, a sense of trust, and and, and you got to find the right people to have those conversations, it's because people know who you can trust, and so a lot of times people are very suspicious. So start there, put a little bit investment in understanding the the what the field looks like in the community, who are the right people you want to talk to, and then have those conversations and spend a little bit of time. So, um, so that's important. Credibility is really important. Right. Who you bring in the room. Thank you. La last question to you, Damien. Um, can you talk a little bit more about workforce development and the state's uh, workforce development program? Are there areas that that could be tuned up and can the community colleges, can UH and the community colleges become more involved? so that we can really get after this. Uh, what's, what's your comment on that? Well, actually, um, we're starting before the community colleges. We're actually working with the high schools right now. Um, the state is gonna have a workforce development in 
looking at revamping some of the the way they teach. Uh, they have teaching in high schools. You know, before you asked to the, we used to have the automotive shop, the wood shop, um, you know, a metal shop. And I think they're looking at bringing some of these things back. And one of it is talking about PV, solar, robotics, uh, automation. Those are the things that uh, the wave of the future, right? That we're doing. So we've been starting this in the high school level. I talked to the uh, universities a while back already about these PV programs, and like I said, I have nothing against them teaching it in there. It's just a matter of I didn't want them to give a falsehood that just because they came out with a certificate, they can run out there and stop putting PV panels all on everybody's homes. You know, again, we want to make sure that it's done properly and it's done safely. Um, so we've, we've started that and the work, we have a lot of people that are uh, getting into this renewable energy, as you can see, because it's gonna be exploding, they know this is the next job that's coming up because not only installing, but eventually maintaining and running it too. So there's a lot of uh, job opportunities for it. Hey, thank you all so much. Uh, we're now POW and off to the next panel. Over to you, Scott Glenn. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in that panel. Um, our third session focuses on energy efficiency and affordability. Buildings account for about 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Hawaii's adoption of the 2018 International Building and Energy Codes will make buildings more efficient and lower the cost of living and working in our buildings for families and businesses. Our first speaker, is a recognized leader in energy, especially energy efficiency. Representative Nicole Lowen, chairperson of the Hawaii House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee and member of the US Department of Energy National Electricity Advisory Committee. Welcome Representative Lowen. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I actually am looking at the title of the panel, Energy Efficiency and Affordability. And knowing that we have so many other experts in energy efficiency, I thought I'd speak a little more on the affordability question more broadly, because what I what I see is that there's often a lot of misconceptions about that there are trade-offs between our goals or that, that climate action comes at a cost to affordability or that things like rooftop solar and electric vehicles only benefit those who can afford them and that they're enjoyed at the expense of those who can't um, or that renewable energy might be good for the environment, but it's bad for our electric bills. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say these things are simply not true. What is true is that this transition is necessary and inevitable and it will benefit everyone and Hawaii's economy overall. So transitions are challenging and there are real challenges, of course, associated with reaching our 100% renewable energy goals, but they are not insurmountable. And you know, doing things differently, learning new things, investing in new infrastructure to support you know, renewables and distributed resources and electric vehicles, you know, this is a big change that's challenging for a big utility company. And that's why I really strongly believe that the role of the legislature and the policy goals that we set and the role of the Energy Policy Forum is, is really important to get over this transitional speed bump. Um, because I've often heard it said that, you know, it's not as simple as just setting a goal, which is obviously we understand that that's true. But I, what I also think is true is without the goals that the legislature has set in the past couple of decades, we would not be where we are today. Um, and at the end of the day for legislators, it's not just about environment and climate change. It's about resilience and independence and affordability in particular, all of which are good for Hawaii's economy. So I wanted, I guess, to just get off my soapbox now and focus a little more on um, energy efficiency, which I feel like I've worked on a lot in my few years as chair of the um, committee in the House. Uh, in 2019, we passed a bill to create Hawaii's first state level appliance efficiency standards. And in, in, recent, in recent years, you know, we passed a bill last year that then got vetoed. So we're back to working on it again this year that we think is a really important measure to uh, uh, encourage that the state undertake energy efficiency measures in its own facilities. And um, in addition to that, this bill would um, mandate that new construction of state facilities uh, is, has efficient design to start out with. And it would also require data transparency for how much money is spent on a state facility energy bills right now. Um, we are also looking at um, a bill that would help facilitate the adoption of our up-to-date building codes and some other energy efficiency measures during this, se this session. 
And um, I guess I'll just end by saying in the wake of COVID-19 and all of the um, economic impacts that it's had, we feel like there's tremendous opportunity in the energy efficiency sector to create new jobs and save people money at the same time. And um, I know that there's a lot of people on this panel who can speak to that um, uh, even better. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lowen, for your powerful message. Um, next up, we have Gwen Yamamoto Lau, Executive Director of the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority. Thank you, Scott. The Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority, or HGIA, was the result of Act 211, which created the framework for establishing a state-administered clean energy financing authority. HGIA's objective is to make clean energy investments accessible and affordable to Hawaii's underserved ratepayers, defined as low and moderate income homeowners, renters, nonprofits, small businesses, and multifamily rental projects. Hawaii's high cost of energy, coupled with our high cost of living, made it a priority for our policymakers to make green energy inclusive and available to our most vulnerable ratepayers, while stimulating private investments and leveraging tools to mitigate risks and reach new markets. Uh, forgive me, I'll be de deviating from the energy efficiency in the, my remaining remarks, uh, in, uh, per se. So, you know, while the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major disruption to everyone, economically, it has disproportionately significantly impacted lower income households, small businesses, and state and local governments. With an estimated 1.8 billion budget deficit, like many households and businesses, the state is capital strapped. As such, it is imperative to proactively seek opportunities to access federal and other funding sources. A bill has been introduced this session to create a clean energy and energy efficiency revolving loan fund, which will allow HGIA to continue to help ratepayers lower their energy costs and seek federal and other sources of funds for loan capital. If passed, the bill will also enable HGIA to finance power purchase agreement purchase options for state agencies, which will create a new cash flow stream that can be utilized to finance the installation of the electric vehicle charging stations and or purchase or lease electric vehicles to transition the state's fleet of internal combustion vehicles to EVs. Personally, I think having the state lease EVs rather than purchase EVs is important as short-term leases which is typically less expensive than financing, will create a supply of relatively new used EVs, which can help eliminate the new EV cost obstacle for our low and moderate income households. Additionally, the state has a policy that any state-owned asset, including vehicles, needs to be offered to other departments before it can be disposed, which means that by purchasing EVs, Existing policy will preclude us from helping our vulnerable communities during our clean transportation transition. What COVID has taught us is it is not business as usual, and collectively, we must all stretch out of our comfort zone to find solutions for a resilient, prosperous, and carbon-free economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwen. Next, uh, we'll hear from Brian K. Aloha, Executive Director for Hawaii Energy. Over to you, Brian. Mahalo, Scott, and mahalo to the State Energy Office and the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for the opportunity to discuss energy efficiency. With my focus, uh, I'm going to be focused on affordability a lot in my commentary this afternoon. Um, I think it's been mentioned several times, and I'll mention it again, with Hawaii having the highest energy costs in the nation, coupled with our high percentage of Alice families, energy affordability was a serious concern. And this was even before the pandemic, which has as Gwen just pointed out, disproportionately impacted low-income families. We've seen the lines for food distribution and the challenges that COVID-19 has brought upon our most vulnerable population. Nationally, one-fourth of all U.S. households and two-thirds of low-income ones have very high energy burdens, which means they spend more than 6% on their energy bills. Two out of every five low-income households have severe energy burdens, meaning that 10% of their income goes towards energy costs. So energy affordability is critical. Reducing energy waste and improving efficiency can go a long way to help. One of the most successful programs we run at Hawaii Energy, the Energy Smart for Homes program, has served over 22,000 households and it's growing. But we wouldn't have had the success we have had without the partnerships of property owners who have multiple sites like Catholic Charities, the City and County of Honolulu, DHHL. However, it's becoming increasingly more challenging to identify those customers 
that need help due to a number of data privacy concerns. We're actively looking for partnerships with community groups and organizations to help better identify those in need and provide resources and training to improve energy literacy. One of the easiest ways to increase energy affordability is strong energy codes. Some developers will have you believe that installing energy efficient equipment adds so much to the cost of the home that they aren't able to do it without a significant increase in cost. However, that is simply not true. Recently, Kea Humoa Place was built in um, uh, reaching LEED Platinum standards, which means that quality housing can be both affordable and sustainable. This housing development had 320 affordable rentals and included thermal hot water systems, water efficient fixtures, drought tolerant landscapes, ceiling fans, large windows that would enhance the flow through ventilation as well as LED lighting. All of this will help reduce the cost of utility bills for residents so they can stay in their homes. Along those lines, as Representative Lowen mentioned in her, her comments, it's imperative for the state to lead by example to demonstrate the benefits of energy efficiency while reducing costs to taxpayers. Many are who are also the families that we're trying to help. A little bit later, I think Mike is gonna be speaking around what's been done at the community colleges. And I do wanna recognize the community colleges for really being a leader in energy and sustainability among state, state facilities. I am excited to see a number of organizations making energy affordability a priority. It will be important that we align our messaging so we don't confuse people as energy is already a very confusing topic. Working together will be critical in our joint work in communities. Uh, yeah, Eric just spoke about building trust in communities in the previous panel, and it's hard work. And it becomes even harder if our messaging and our goals are not aligned. So in closing, as we look to 2021, it'll be critical to keep the focus and funding on efforts that will drive affordability in our communities so that our residents can make smart energy choices that will save money save energy, and keep us on the path to 100% clean energy future. Mahalo. Mahalo, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, now let's welcome uh, Brandon Hayashi, Regional Business Development Manager for NG Services, Hawaii Region. Brandon. Mahalo, Scott, and aloha, everyone. I'd like to start with a brief analogy about mindset, born from the subject matter of the next session, actually. You know, in the U.S., we measure the efficiency of a vehicle by its miles per gallon, but in nearly every other country, a slightly different metric of measurement is used, liters per 100 kilometers. We focus on the distance, and most of the world focuses on the fuel resource. While this may sound like semantics, it is not. It speaks to our outlook, our perspective, and importantly, what we choose to prioritize. And so in a similar vein, you know, energy efficiency needs to be seen not as a be less bad or do more with less type of mentality, but rather by viewing it as a true resource that is critical to our island's climate and resilience goals. I'm certainly not the first one to say that efficiency needs to be seen as a valuable resource, but I firmly believe that this change mindset will empower us to make more, even more progressive policies, create innovative business models, and really run public sector RFPs that reflect its true value. Many folks already with regards to the situation have spoken about the impact and the challenges coming from COVID-19. And I just want to underscore uh, really from a community as well as a de developer perspective that in spite of this, there are indeed real opportunities to create positive change both within the public and the private sectors relating to efficiency and of course clean energy as a whole. Now with regard to challenges, yes, things take a long time to get developed here and, and yes, Attracting more capital investment here to our islands would be fantastic. These are but two of the many challenges that we all have. But I would argue that the solutions reside in the challenges themselves. So when we talk about policies, processes, projects, perspectives, and importantly, underscoring all of this, of course, are people. If we can have greater alignment, as was talked about at the beginning and opening of the session, we can have greater alignment around our why. And I'm not saying it's going to be an easy ride. Changing the hearts and minds of people is very difficult. But we can properly address many of the challenges that we have in front of us that are tied to technical, financial, environmental, and social issues with this change mindset. So I want to spend a little bit of time on the solutions. Um, and I certainly don't have enough time to go through even the seven that I've listed there. And that is by no means an exhaustive list. I did want to talk about two real briefly. The new financing models and actionable process roundtables, for lack of a better term. With regards to the former, you know, Governor Ige has signaled that his administration may end up seeking $800 million less in the 
from the last two years for uh, compared to the last two years for construction going forward for general obligation bonds. And this is where energy related construction projects with new business models that have the ability to attract capital to help bolster jobs as well as tax revenue for some of those potential delayed or halted infrastructure projects could significantly help our state. And you know, like the discussion that was just had between agriculture and utility scale energy projects, trust and relationships matter. We need to understand each other and figure out ways to be more time efficient. We are in the decade of action. There's a real impetus for us to sit down with one another. And for example, could government agencies and energy service companies sit down to share and listen to one another as to how we might be able to create expedited processes, shared risks, stakeholder engagement, and so forth so that we have real pathways forward to build more projects, I believe we can. And with that, I just want to say thank you, and I'll carry on to the next speaker. Thank you, Brandon. Um, our next speaker is Mike Unibasami, Vice President for Community Colleges and Associate Vice President for Administrative Affairs at the University of Hawaii. Thank you, Mike. Scott, aloha, everybody. Uh, we began looking at sustainability opportunities for the community colleges over 10 years ago. Our strategy was to first address energy conservation and efficiency measures, which we did using the performance contract statute, HRS 3641, understanding that renewable energy does not reduce energy consumption. So phase one performance contract targeted energy conservation and energy efficiency measures. Using FY 2008 as our baseline, our conservation and efficiency measures resulted in a KWH reduction uh, by 2018 of over 22%. These projects also reduced our deferred maintenance by more than $15 million. We then focused phase two on additional energy efficiency measures with emphasis on renewable energy coupled with battery storage. Our efforts have resulted in Leeward Community College becoming the first net zero UH campus and we think the first in the nation to become uh, net zero, producing all of our energy on campus. And we energized everything in July of 2020. UH Maui College just became the second net zero UH campus. The other five community college campuses are in different phases, increasing its dependency on renewable energy. Once we complete our current efforts in renewable energy, the seven community college campuses will be generating over 60% of its electricity requirements, all on our campuses. This amounts to 16 million KWH generated and 42 MWH of battery storage capacity. We have had tremendous working relationships with JCI and initially with Brian Kealoha with uh, Chevron Energy Solutions when we first uh, ventured into all of uh, the things that we're doing now. And uh, currently we're working with, uh, uh, with Pacific Current uh, with all of our PPAs. And you, know, you need good partners in trying to achieve what uh, we're doing. And uh, all of these people that, and companies that we've worked with have come through for us. And we're thankful uh, for the working relationships and the results of uh, the, the efforts that we all have. So very uh, happy with what we've been able to accomplish over the years. Thank you, Mike, um, and we are as well. So next, uh, we'd like to um, turn it over to our state consumer advocate, Dean Nishina. Uh, Dean, if you'd like to share a few words. Oh, mahalo, Scott, and good afternoon to everyone, and aloha to everyone in Hawaii and in other time zones. Um, I, I think, as, as Damien had mentioned, sometimes going last, there are potential pitfalls, and um, I am going to be focusing on affordability, which kind of was raised a little bit by Representative Luan as well as Brian K. Aloha. But um, I, I guess I'll start off by if if you look at the um, the slide that I have, on the left-hand side, there are two graphs. And you know uh, the intent of these graphs is to provide people with sort of a, um, a better understanding of some of the numbers behind the affordability issue, especially as it relates to Hawaii. So the, these graphs are based on a um, report that's 
published every year by a group called Fisher, Sheehan, and Colton. And they do a, an analysis based on a model that they have uh, county by county basis across this, the United States. And so the, the graphs that I, I have here are, are for Hawaii, where um, for, for those of you who may, may have a little trouble seeing the graph, I'll just kind of uh, explain them briefly, where the, the top left-hand graph um, shows the home energy burden as a percentage of income for people um, of, of a certain um, ranking as it relates to the federal poverty level. So um, if, if I, I can, um, in 2019, for people below 50% of the federal po poverty level, um, the home energy burden is approximately 44%. What that means is that um, of their income, uh, about 44% of their income is at needs to be spent on a home energy bill, um, which obviously is too high. As, as Brian mentioned, the, um, the, the general benchmark for affordability is 6%. So this, the top hand, left hand graph shows that um, for you know, uh, different rankings from below 50% up to 200% of the federal poverty level. So again, everybody knows Hoy's electricity rates are high. Everybody knows the bills is high, but you know, this really puts it into, um, it, uh, you know, really highlights the, the, the point that we really do need to work on making Hawaii's energy bills more affordable. Um, the lower left-hand graph shows the number of households. Um, and, and, and basically it, it does show that there's a significant amount of households that are um, of a level where the, uh, as it relates to the federal poverty level, uh, approximately 25% of, of the households in Hawaii um, are, are facing unaffordable energy bills. If I can, you know, um, part of our, our duty and responsibility in terms of representing consumer interests before the Public Utilities Commission is to try to make things more affordable. And, and generally, I'll, I'll just offer, you know, three strategies that we're trying to, to pursue is make overall costs affordable. Um, because the concern is that if we um, try to come up with, you know, separate programs to aid um, low income, moderate income customers, it, it can be um, actually incur additional administrative costs, as well as people People falling through the cracks. So, you know, um, one of the strategies is trying to make overall, uh, overall system costs lower so that everybody would be facing lower bills. Um, another one is, as mentioned um, by um, Rick, uh, early, earlier speaker, is, you know, we really do need to work on educating customers about, you know, um, energy consumption and options for them, um, as well as looking at redesigning rates. Um, you know, that's been something we've been pushing for a number of years. And, and you know, it's, it's something that we're working on right now in a docket with the commission uh, as it relates to advanced um, rate design issues and strategies. Um, and another I guess another strategy that we are trying to um, ensure is that program designs um, really do consider the impact on all customers, not just the participants, but all customers, because we want to make sure that, again, we keep the overall costs reasonable. And we'll recognize that energy efficiency is, is, is often recognized as one of the lowest cost options as it relates to a resource for energy grid. Um, and so, you know, that's where we've been working with Hawaii Energy in terms of trying to make sure that you know, we're, we're, we're stepping away from rebates and tax credits because those tend to benefit those people who have money to uh, engage in those programs. Otherwise, I, I appreciate the opportunity to offer these comments. Um, mahalo to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, and thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts, especially Rep. Lowen, for being able to stay with us today. Um, now we have some time for questions. So, Mitch, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for one question, and this is for Rep. Lowen. It's like elephant in the room. Um, so this is the question. It seems certain that there will be efforts in the upcoming legislative session to ramp down and reduce the state's renewable energy tax credit. What's your position and Senator Wakai's position? I know you can't speak for Senator Wakai on ramping down and or reducing the tax credit. This is on everybody's top of mind. Yeah, I, obviously I can't speak for Senator Wakai. I'm not planning on introducing any bills relating to this, so we'll have to see what comes our way. We did amend the tax credit last year to give more certainty to utility scale developers in that arena. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I mean, I still, I support in keeping the tax credit. I mean, I think that we need to continue. We're not at capacity yet for installation of rooftop solar. Um, and we want to ensure that, you know, now that the, the 
early adopters have um, utilized the tax credit to take it away now when it's becoming more affordable for lower and middle income families, there's more financing options, et cetera, it seems um, like they should also have the option to benefit from this tax credit. Um, and we've also, I think, seen, we're going to see the, um, the claims on the tax credit reduce just with the economy as well. And so if there's concerns, of course, there's massive concerns about the budget and that's gonna be part of the conversation too. So, I mean, my stance generally has been that I support maintaining the tax credit. It's kind of a odd and unusual policy to have a tax credit that has no sunset date whatsoever. So, I mean, at some point we'll have to look at when it makes sense to let market forces um, take control in that sector. But, um, you know, in, in advance, like that's, like, I guess that's the extent of my comments, having not seen a bill or seen any testimony, I can't really give a definitive answer on, on how I would vote on something if I haven't even seen it yet. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's my time. And uh, over to you, Scott Glenn. All right. Well, thank you, Mitch. And uh, thank you, everyone. And realize we're, we're getting up on time and we also recognize it's Friday afternoon. And so um, we are going to move ahead to the next session. Um, that session is focusing on clean transportation. And if you aren't already aware, um, for Hawaii's greenhouse gas emissions, that transportation as an overall sector has now exceeds power production for the source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Uh, within that, ground transportation is uh, the highest source of our transportation emissions. And we have six distinguished speakers from the public and private sector who will delve into the details of clean transportation today. Um, our first speaker at Sniffen, unfortunately, um, is currently occupied with a different legislative matter. I think he's testifying at the moment. Uh, so um, we will bypass him for the moment and perhaps uh, Ben Sullivan, um, if we could go to you. Uh, ben is the Energy and Sustainability Manager for Kauai County. So Ben, over to you, please. Absolutely, Scott. Thank you. Let me just pull my notes up here. Caught me off guard. All right. First off, I want to give a big mahalo to HSEO for, for helping us pull this together for organizing with Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Um, and I want to say that Hawaii State Energy Office has done a great job in the last year, really increasing the amount of collaboration between the county and the state. And that has been um, of tremendous value to us. So, so thank you for that, um, to Scott and your whole team. Um, the next thing I want to do, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit and touch just, just briefly on electricity because I was on that panel previously and you guys moved me. So uh, I'll get into transportation in a second. But the, the remarks I have on, on, on electricity, um, and really all these remarks are about how do we, you know, how do we think about climate action and clean energy aligning with economic recovery? More importantly, how do all of these things help Kauai's low and moderate income households and small businesses? You know, that's what this is all about right now is helping small business, helping, helping families that are struggling as uh, previous speakers have said. Um, and so that's, that's the objective. Um, you know, thank you, uh, Rep. Lowen, for pointing out that these issues are not intention. You know, we can succeed on the long term by investing in our future, and we can also have a clean energy future and reduce our emissions, and there is an imperative to do so. Um, I think it's abundantly clear that we can help our households and small businesses here on Kauai and around the state while accelerating our shift, both on the electricity grid and with ground transportation. So as everyone knows really well, KUC is leading and has done a tremendous job with renewable energy, and we are tremendously lucky for their leadership on the utility side of the grid. Um, with regards to energy efficiency on the customer side of the grid, we feel that there's still a tremendous opportunity here on Kauai and around the state. Um, two major customer needs to increase energy efficiency that we see. One is financing mechanisms. So Gwen Yamamoto Lao did a great job talking about this. Um, HB 1844 was a bill that really made a lot of sense previously. Um, nobody has mentioned the, you know, the um, National Climate Bank, but I'm, cer I'm certain, you know, Senator Schatz is going to keep pushing that idea, especially given what happened in Georgia recently. And then, you know, we also have access to funding through the R Rural Utility Service that, that Gwen's bill and other opportunities would help open up. Um, the second thing in energy efficiency that, that is really important is more streamlined access to data. Um, and this is customer utility data and, and having the ability to to authorize third parties to use it. So I, I'm looking right now at, J, at Jay Griffin and I'm hoping that the PUC can help accelerate those, those requirements within the utilities statewide because it has, a, you know, I mean, let's think of a, a financial tech app like Mint and imagine it applied to the utility sector where you can basically just bring your utility bill in and immediately know what the opportunities are to save money in your household or your small business. Full stop, 
switching over to transportation. The, the approach that, that Kauai County is taking on transportation is really about mode shift and accessibility. So I know other folks are gonna talk about electrification today and we think that is an important secondary strategy, but ultimately we think it's about getting people out of single occupancy vehicles and into more diverse solutions um, for a lot of reasons, because it's a healthier community that's created because we can't afford the roads that are gonna be necessary to keep expanding car ownership because it's cheaper in the long run for everybody and also because the emissions are lower and, and that is needed. Um, a couple of outcomes that, the, you know, that, are, that are results of the pandemic right now that are interesting related to this point. One is that half of our rental cars have been shipped off the island. So obviously there's no demand and the response has been a reset in the, in the visitor industry. We really see the visitor industry as an area in which we can um, use strategically to, to really make this mode shift begin to happen across our whole community. We recently had a meeting with, with uh, Mayor Cavallo and, Rep I'm sorry, Mayor Kawakami, that's a big faux pas, I've been working here too long in the county. Uh, Mayor Kawakami led off a meeting um, with HDOT, Hawaii Tourism Authority and local businesses, as well as our planning department, and really talked about how this vision is critical to the island. One thing that we need the support of um, for sta from state agencies across the board is, is coming on, on in line with that vision and really helping us to see it happen. So if that, you know, if that talks about a, a choice between adding capacity on roadways versus looking at mode shift opportunities, that's, that's where we, you know, we want to be thinking about those things. If that means looking at our, our rental car capacity versus other options like shuttles, those are the kind of things we want to do. I will stop there. Um, hope we get a chance for some Q&A and, and thanks Scott again. Thank you, Ben. I, I know you always have a lot to contribute to the conversation. Um, we, uh, we, we went ahead with Ed, without Ed, but he is here with us now. So Aki, if you don't mind, we'll go back to uh, Ed Sniffen. We're very fortunate to have him, Deputy Director, Highways Division of the Hawaii Department of Transportation. And Ed, would you like to say a few words and thank you for making time to join us. Thank you, Scott. I apologize for being late, everyone. Um, Ed Sniffin with DOT, thank you very much for having me. For us, we know that transportation is the dirtiest industry in the world. And, and we know it because Scott keeps telling me that every day. Um, so we're trying to do our best in, to make sure that we are part of the solution rather than the problem. So we've been greening our operations throughout. We pushed forward on our $60 million ESCO contract that helped us reduce our energy draw by 50% or so. Um, and we're pushing forward on green co uh, construction methodologies to ensure that we use better materials so we can uh, minimize the maintenance that's required throughout the system. We pushed forward on CO2 entrained concrete that allowed us to entrain CO2 into our concrete, increase the, the strength of the concrete, and allowed us to decrease the amount of cement we put into it. So all of that, thanks to Aki for bringing it to us, to, um, our attention, um, and allowing us to pilot that um, on our system. Now we're pushing into um, our AC materials to make sure that we start looking at plastics going in there, trying to dump all of our waste into our, into our pavement to ensure that nobody has to deal with it anymore. That's the least we can do because of the, the CO2 footprint that we have in transportation. We wanna make sure that we push forward on all of these things, um, and especially on electrification. Ben, ben said it well, boat shift is the best thing but we know people don't wanna give up their cars right now. So we wanna make sure that when they do choose their cars, they can start reducing their own footprint as well. We also know that we would love for everybody to convert, but we can't do it unless government leads. So we push forward on a contract that allows us to lease the, the services of an EV uh, without having to purchase it up front. That contract is open for all state agencies and all county administrations throughout. So we're hoping that we can push a big, um, make a big push for everybody to start converting throughout. For the state itself, we have 2,000 vehicles, ICE vehicles that we could convert to immediately. The technology is there. Uh, for highways, we have 300. We're going to replace our 300 in the next two years with 250 electric vehicles. So that's, that other 50 will be gone. We're not going to use them anymore because we know we don't need them. So we're going to use this opportunity not only uh, to convert, but also to get more efficient in our operations. All of this leads to the new, the new norm that we're looking for. Um, at this time, especially during this pandemic, we know that our mission to connect people to their, um, their goods and services and opportunities is not just a physical one. It's not just a drive, a bike or a walk away. Now virtual is a big thing for us. So we're pushing forward on a broadband initiative that allows us to connect all of our systems, state and county systems to a broadband or wireless mesh to ensure that we can put cameras or data collection devices anywhere on the system that we're ready for connected autonomous vehicles when it comes through in the future. But more importantly, at this time, to be able to help out and connect those, in, those communities that are underserved 
at this time that run parallel into our, um, to our facilities. So we'll use the backbone of, of the highway system and the county system and the federal funding that comes with it to ensure that we build out to connect everybody sooner rather than later. And that all goes back to transportation again, because we can't push a, a vibrant teleworking industry or teleworking community without that connectivity. So we're gonna help bridge that, that, that digital gap, that digital divide, make sure that everybody can live and, and or work and learn from home and make sure that our, our connectivity is not just physical. My hope is if we can push for 10,000 public workers and 5,000 private to start working um, from home or from, from alternate locations regularly, uh, in general, it helps us tremendously because now the peak traffic is gone. The CO2 burn from that, that, that methodology is gone and everything gets cleaner. So that's the hope that we have. That's the push that we're making. And we really appreciate the work that we get to do with Scott and his office. He's been helping us out tremendously because I really don't know what I'm doing. So we push in a certain direction. He kind of recorrects us and we go for it. It works out really well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ed, and uh, we greatly appreciate your, your leadership and vision on helping to bring about the digital carbon-free economy, which is how we work together on this, right? Next up, we have Aki Marceau, Director of Electrification and Transportation at Hawaiian Electric Company. And just for the audience's awareness, Aki's previous life, she was with Elemental Accelerator, where she helped introduce this carbon sequestration company to the uh, highways division. So over to you, Aki. Yes, Hawaiian Electric is not in the concrete industry all of a sudden, so thanks for that clarification. Um, and I know it's the afternoon, it's Sunday after, not Sunday afternoon, Friday afternoon right now, and um, I can say that there's no place I'd rather be than on a transportation panel. Um, but for the 221 of you that are still with us right now, thank you so much for making it this far. Um, as Representative Lowen pointed out in her opening remarks, we are in a triple crisis right now, health, economy, and climate. And I'm excited to reaffirm that electric transportation improves people's lives on day one. So it can reduce pollution, create shovel ready jobs in a growing industry and put downward pressure on electricity rates for everyone. And that includes businesses and families. So of note, transportation accounts for over 50% of CO2 emissions in Hawaii as Scott mentioned, and ground transportation is about half of that. Electric transportation not only reduces CO2 in this sector, it also improves renewable energy integration, creates energy security, and generates resilience by serving as what we would call rolling storage. So this all leads to things like cost control and reduced variability for our community, which are things that we're all concerned about. Um, I'm not sure how, how much you all follow EV news these days, but there's been a lot of big announcements lately. And in recent news, one of the big auto giants, General Motors, uh, they announced an electric Hummer, but that's not their big announcement. They just completed a new rebrand to re reflect an all electric future. And so this also is tied to $27 billion, and that's billion with a B, um, and 30 new electric vehicles over the next five years. And part of their rebrand is using the term everybody in. And that's the name of the campaign. It's really to show that these old ideas about electric vehicles are no longer applicable. And so in the same way, um, one of the biggest barriers that we encounter is myths. And um, my ask is really similar to the General Motors campaign, everybody in. Um, one of the biggest myths that I've heard that Representative Lowen mentioned in her earlier remarks is that electric vehicles are only for the wealthy. And when I hear that, I think about early electric vehicles that were maybe primarily only dominated by the luxury market. Now there are over 40 models and they're growing. And I'd also like to add that there's a very robust used EV market as well. I personally got a used EV. Um, so I can attest to that. I think it's important to recognize that electric vehicles aren't just for families and individuals, but also for businesses. And so we've heard from the counties and the state, but all four counties committed to electrifying their fleets. And we've committed to electrifying our fleet at Hoyn Electric. And there's a lot of other businesses that are doing the same thing. The city and county of Honolulu, they actually just delivered their first electric bus and that's the first of 17 electric buses. So soon everybody 
will be able to ride electric by hopping on a public bus. So this will be accessible to everyone. So this leads me to the point that we collectively, the collective we have the ability to be part of this transition, um, or we can choose to have it happen to us. From hearing you know, the, the panelists, I think we're, we wanna be part of this transition. And if we are part of it, we can design it to be accessible to everyone. But in order to do this, we need to really have that alignment and we need everybody in. So thinking about the future at Hawaiian Electric, we have a number of exciting projects in the queue. Um, where we are working on infrastructure development, new rates, expanded public charging, and many are involving a lot of collaboration with our state partners. And so I'm happy to discuss that uh, more during the Q&A. And lastly, oh, am I, am I at time? Yes. Okay, I'll just close my comments with that. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, Aki, very much. Um, up until now for this, it's mainly been focused on um, electrification of transportation, mode shift, and affordability. We also have some other aspects of the, of the transportation shift away from fossil fuels. And our next speaker is Bob King, founder and president of Pacific Biodiesel. Thank you very much for having me today, Scott and the whole team. Appreciate it. Three minutes, I'm going to rush through where a few points here. We Pacific Biodiesel made 5.8 million gallons last year of the lowest greenhouse gas transportation fuel in Hawaii, biodiesel. Lowest life cycle greenhouse gas fuel that you can put on the road. We made it predominantly from local feedstocks, restaurant oils, grease trap oil, some crop oils that we grew, and, and about, but, um, uh, about half of our feedstock did have to come in from the mainland. Uh, waste oils and Guam, Alaska, wherever we can find them. Uh, that's the placeholder for agricultural oils in Hawaii, and our, our goal is to displace those imported waste oils with agricultural oil. So our predominant use was, in fact, uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, at Schofield Barracks on Oahu and Hamako Energy on the Big Island for power generation. Rough equivalent of our production is about 250 megawatt hours per day of electricity, yeah, if we put it all into power gen, power gen. The challenges that we have is that this year our our source of oil, the the feedstock oils, are um, are down quite a bit. Uh, obviously, the restaurants are are, are not uh, running, so um, it did cause us to have to bring in a little bit more oil from the mainland and. Um, and um, we're, we're still trying to find that model where the, to get the crop oils up to scale so we can grow more of our fuel here. Part of that is to get the rest of the rotational crops going, which is the culinary oils um, and cosmetics. Uh, there's a lot of added, value added cropping that will happen when, when we grow energy crops. So it's, a, it's an exciting future. I think it's, um, I think it's going to be a big play in the uh, coming forward, but we've got a lot to do. So 2021 needs, uh, we've, um, we've got the biodiesel plant, we've got firm offtake from utilities and on-road fleets. Uh, now we need the feedstock. So let's get the oil going, uh, getting up to from the 100 acre farm up to a 1500 acre farm is the next step. Um, significant amount of capital involved to do that. Um, but also bringing, as we bring these rotational crops and the food crops that go along with it, um, there's a lot of processing that we just don't have in Hawaii. You know, we don't, we don't have the, the way to get from the farm to the grocery store with a lot of these new and exciting local products. So all of that's jobs, 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 um, um, a predominant amount of the money that you, you spend for bio energy is going to be labor and, and jobs. And that's an, another exciting piece for Hawaii in the future. Great. Thank you very much, Bob. And, uh, and just to clarify earlier, you mentioned oil in your remarks and you meant bio oil. I only talk about bio or vegetable oils. And <laughs> yeah, uh, we, don't, we don't put do any petroleum refining. Thank you. Um, uh, now I'd like to welcome Chuck Collins, Executive Director of the Hawaii Hydrogen Alliance. Over to you, Chuck. Thank you, Scott. Um, I want to say a quick hi to Mitch and Rick. Um, thanks for uh, your pursuit over the years. Appreciate what your folks are doing. Um, Aloha Kakao and Aloha Friday. 
On behalf of the Hawaii Hydrogen Alliance, we wish to extend a big mahalo to everyone involved with this broadcast today. The Hawaii State Energy Office, Think Tech Hawaii, the panelists, and Senator Glenn Wakai for allowing us to be a part of this conversation today. The Hawaii Hydrogen Alliance is a Hawaii-based nonprofit advancing hydrogen production from local renewable energy resources. Our members assist with education, policy, and projects that help move green hydrogen forward in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific region. Our group includes key hydrogen and fuel cell stakeholders from around the globe, representing large manufacturers, startups, government and universities, and our sister organizations as well. Hydrogen and fuel cell projects for transportation, baseload power, and microgrid projects are rapidly coming into focus, creating a range of opportunities for workforce development, technology deployment, and further research. Deployment of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies into key areas of our state becomes part of a central strategy for the widespread implementation of zero emissions, clean energy and transportation plan for the state. Proactive state and local policies around hydrogen fueling, storage and use are needed now more than ever to help shape the business climate align government and guide future project investments here in the state. The Hawaii Hydrogen Alliance members are excited for the new year. We believe this the timing is right for hydrogen and fuel cell projects to grow across Hawaii. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Chuck. We greatly appreciate you being here today. Um, next, we'd like to uh, welcome Thor Toma, Vice President for Projects and New Initiatives at Servco. Over to you, Thor. Mahalo, Scott and Mitch. Great seeing you all today. Uh, and aloha to everyone. Uh, aloha Friday. Uh, as many of you know, Servco is a local company with over 100 years of uh, experience in the automotive industry here in Hawaii. Servco's worked on many automotive technologies, including uh, hybrids, PHVs, and of course, hydrogen fuel cells. And you know what's quite clear in our experience is that it's going to take a portfolio of technologies to help reduce uh, our dependency on fossil fuels. There's really no one technology that does it all. That said, hydrogen is part of that solution. You know, Servco has taken a leadership role in Hawaii to help the general public understand the benefits of hydrogen. We've committed quite a bit of resources and time for education and outreach. Uh, but interestingly, our best outreach has been our Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell customers who drive with hydrogen every single day. Now, these are not prototypes. These are not demonstration cars. These are full production vehicles out on the roads every day using hydrogen. Surfco is also 100% funded, built, and manage a hydrogen fueling station in Mapunapuna. You know, that effort we believe has benefits for others, uh, other companies to really build out infrastructure because, you know, one of the challenges that we face, the biggest hurdles was getting building department and fire department approvals to build the station. You know, our experiences, uh, our conversations, discussions with many of these, uh, these key people I think really helps bridge the way for other companies to build infrastructure. So, you know, what can you all do to help support hydrogen? You know, really it's creating and uh, supporting legislation, policies, incentives to help companies, entities build hydrogen infrastructure. You know, this in turn helps uh, really encourage hydrogen product vendors, whether it's stationary power, uh, heavy duty trucks, buses, trams, forklifts, and of course, cars bring their technologies to the island. You know, one example of hydrogen legislation is a bill that Senator Wakai introduced last year regarding hydrogen measurement standards. Uh, I certainly encourage all of you to take a look at that uh, this year when it's reintroduced. You know, in closing, if you haven't had the opportunity to drive a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, the all new second generation Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell vehicle will be launching this month. Thank you very much for your time and uh, mahalo. Thank you very much, Thor. And thank you all speakers um, for helping us to better understand Hawaii's efforts in clean transportation from electrification to biodiesel to hydrogen. 
I know we're after four o'clock, um, but I still would like to make sure there's a time for Q&A. So Mitch, um, over to you for any questions for the speakers. Thanks very much, Scott. Yes, I have one, uh, one question <clears throat> um, and I'm gonna read it. Uh, with uh, reducing carbon in the transportation sector, the assumption is that transportation will move to electric drive. I think we can all pretty well agree with that. This will not only increase power generation by nearly 100%, drive a significant increase in grid delivery in infrastructure. Are HECO and the state looking at that dramatic demand for electricity in their strategic planning? So that may not be inside your uh, wheelhouse there, Aki, and, uh, but maybe more on Scott's side, but do you wanna give it a shot first? We're all worried about having to rebuild the grid to supply all the electricity required. Sure. I, I mean, the answer is yes, we are, we are, you know, we have an entire planning department and that is something that we are looking into and considering. Um, but I'd also like to add that our goal is not for everyone to charge their vehicles necessarily at, you know, 6 p.m. when in a new normal situation, they come home from work, I guess, but rather to um, use market tools like rate design to incentivize charging in the middle of the day when renewable energy is abundant too. And so that really allows for the fuel of your car to be powered by solar and wind and other renewable sources. Um, and so we've introduced a number of rates. All of our EV rates currently use time of use design. And there's a few, you know, for commercial entities that are currently being reviewed by the commission that also have that time of use structure. And so we're really hoping that, you know, using market pull and of course outreach education and other forms of design that we can really incentivize folks to charge in the middle of the day. And that'll really reduce any um, infrastructure pressure on the grid as well. Thank you very much for that answer. And of course, uh, we in the hydrogen community are looking for a special hydrogen rate so that we can make hydrogen that's uh, competitive with other fuel solutions. I had to get that in. <laughs> so uh, that's all, that's my question. Just uh, that's my one question. I, we're out of time. I want to uh, maintain our time frame here. So Scott Glenn, over to you. Thank you, Mitch, and thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon for uh, our panelists for the clean transportation discussion. We greatly appreciate you making time again on a, on a Friday afternoon. To round out our presentations today, saved Commissioner Jay Griffin, Chairperson of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, present last to round out the discussions. He's here today to share his thoughts and what's been going on with the Public Utilities Commission. So, Commissioner Griffin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Hey, Scott and Aloha, everyone. I wasn't sure if the idea here was to wear me down or to wear down the audience, uh, but thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, given the time and some more constraints here, I'm foregoing any slides. So I'm gonna try and speak off of some of the material that I prepared. I'll send what I have uh, over to the energy office so we can post it. But really I was asked to um, uh, talk about two big areas. One is to summarize the decision we issued in late December on the performance-based regulation framework. Uh, so I'll talk to that for a little while. But I did want to touch on some of the other major decisions that we issued at the end of the year, as well as um, what I see in the, the year ahead in 2021, some of our uh, highlights here. So first I'll talk about performance-based regulation framework, and I'm going to challenge myself to work to uh, discuss this with as few acronyms and regulatory jargon as possible. Um, we have a summary, a five page, well, one page and a five page summary of the decision on our uh, website. I actually dis, just did see today a very good white paper that Ulupono Initiative has put out about 20 pages about the decision. It's, it was over 200 pages itself, a lot of significant detail about new regulatory mechanisms. So we're trying to distill all this, make it accessible to people uh, and still capture some of the significant components. So first, I just want to highlight that this was really a 10 plus year evolution of regulatory change in the state, uh, consistent as the state has looked to increase its renewable energy goals. Uh, we've also looked at adjusting the regulatory framework to make to align the utilities incentives along with those goals. And as you know, as our state has moved to 100% renewables, really the benchmark was set as high as possible. And so as the commission endeavored on this, you know, we looked at really a transformational framework uh, that was consistent with 
the, the new renewable goals that the state has set out and to help align, and, and we're talking about our investor owned utility here at Hawaiian Electric, align their financial performance with the state's goals, energy goals that we've set out and you know, with a strong emphasis on uh, cost management, understand that we're in uh, an environment with the highest, co highest electricity costs in the nation. That was really the, the challenge to ourselves and the stakeholders that we started on this. Well over 10 years ago, we started on regulatory reform with decoupling. Uh, we've done reviews on that during the course of it. But really what's, what um, kick-started our work on performance-based regulation was the legislation that passed in 2018, Act 5, the Ratepayer Protection Act. I just want to read uh, one section of that that really uh, shaped and challenged the commission and others to do something that had not been done yet, as far as I, as I understand in the nation. And so that law said, uh, the Public Utilities Commission shall establish performance incentives and penalty mechanisms that directly tie an electric utilities revenues to that utility's achievement on performance metrics. I'm gonna emphasize this and break the direct link between allowed revenues and investment levels. As far as we knew that that's never been asked of, of any commission uh, in any electric utility in the country. I think there was a lot of um, uncertainty in the beginning, how we would create a new regulatory framework and meet the goals of this act. And so we engaged in an extensive two and a half year, two phase stakeholder process. Uh, in the first year plus, we spent time with stakeholders, held multiple workshops, just getting people uh, clear on what the existing regulatory framework uh, consists of, because it, it actually already consists of a lot of elements of what are known as performance-based regulation, but really also talking about where we wanted to go, what are the state's goals and ambitions, and what changes are necessary to accomplish that. We think that was fundamental to being able to accomplish what we've arrived at uh, late in December. The commission invested a ton of time and all the stakeholders, to their credit, uh, put immense time into the meetings that we've held, the, the filings they put before the commission. So we thank them for that. We tried to host uh, as much of that and record it online. A lot of that can be found on our website. That culminated in the, the decision that was issued on December 23rd, 2020. We do have some posts, uh, post decision, or actually we have a lot of work post decision and that uh, working group started this morning. And really the, the major elements of the framework will go into effect in full June 1st, 2021. So what I talked about in, in December, we, we, uh, that was uh, the end of the beginning. And really now we're fully underway with the implementation of this new framework. And so I do wanna to touch on in our, the phase one of this process, we really asked ourselves, is reform necessary to meet our state's energy goals? And if so, what, uh, what reforms are, are required? And what was one of the things, and I have a slide on this that came uh, from one of our stakeholder presentations, but one of the most uh, surprising and eye-opening statements made to all of us, or at least for myself personally, was a presentation. We asked um, representatives of the financial community, both those that rec represent stock uh, shareholders and the uh, credit community. We had a presentation, very interesting presentation, uh, from the, the analyst who covers Hawaiian Electric for Moody's. Uh, so their credit rating agent, uh, agency traditionally had been very conservative, concerned about major changes to regulatory frameworks. The title of the second slide is Cost of Service Regulation, which is the traditional framework, leads utilities down the wrong path. And their, his major points were, uh, in doing so, utilities spend money to make money. They're incentivized against non-capital projects and uh, the different types of cost trackers and pre-approvals uh, create incentives for utilities to uh, really inflate their costs. So this, I mean, this was very eye-opening for all of us. This is not when we invited uh, folks like this, not what we were expecting, but it was very consistent with other reforms that have been underway in other countries along this area. The UK and Canada have been pioneers in this area. So really they were ahead of the curve with the other members of the financial community and ultimately, in our, our phase one decision, we largely agreed that we did need to make these significant changes, but we wanted to do so in a way that balances both the customer benefits of the new change in the framework, uh, maintains utilities financial uh, stability, and creates a, a, a more efficient system for everyone. And so I, the, as I said earlier, the decision has it was 200 plus pages. 
um, has a lot of elements in it. And I'm, I'm going to talk about four different areas. And it's not the, the complete uh, rundown of the decision. You can find some of our materials online about that. So the first area I want to talk about is a strong emphasis in this decision about cost management. Establishing a feature system that instills strong cost controls and actually a, a strong financial incentive for the electric utility to manage their costs efficiently. And what we have moved to is what's called a revenue cap system versus a traditional uh, rate case, cost of service, rate based um, investment system. And really, basically, the difference is uh, under the traditional system, Hawaiian Electric, with every three years, each company would file what's known as a rate case with us. These are extensive filings, thousands and thousands of pages. They ask the commission to raise revenues to cover their costs and any uh, new capital they've invested. And really, there's lots of pressure always with these cases to increase rates. Not a lot of strong cost control incentives. You heard what I just said, uh, what Moody said. Under revenue cap, We've established a formula indexed by inflation for the next five years. And so Hawaiian Electric and all of us know uh, what their revenue trajectory is for about 50% of their costs, what we call target revenues. So these are all the costs that are largely in their control. Uh, it's a known uh, index based uh, cap for the next five years. And just to, and so what we can look at is what is that future path of revenues under the formula that was established through the past two years versus the system that would have been in place. Um, I have some uh, projections of that, but if we look at what Hawaiian Electric's last rate case filing was, um, along with some projections, we're talking about several hundred million dollars of potential savings from you know, what would have happened under the prior status quo uh, versus the new revenue cap that is in place today. But I think what is um, interesting about this and what potentially makes it or provides an opportunity for it to be win-win is now the utility can look at ways to manage their costs below this revenue cap. And for the next five years, they get to retain those savings as profit. That's not really, not a strong incentive to do that today. And so we'll see whether um, Wine Electric can find those efficiencies, they get to keep them. And then at the end of this period, we'll re-review and most likely you know, revise that cap to capture those savings. So it does provide a greater opportunity for profit, but one, again, we're aligning the utility's ability to profit with something that we've found necessary to manage costs. That's a key element of the framework overall. Where do we find, how can we find win-win situations? This is a very powerful one. Uh, the experience in the other utilities and places uh, there's a lot of detail goes into setting that formula right, but it's generally been effective at this outcome. We'll move on to a couple other areas. The second major area, uh, which is the target of what are known as performance incentive mechanisms, and really these are carrots incentive payments for the utility to achieve uh, certain outcomes. And we've established five new performance incentive mechanisms. mechanisms. The centerpiece of this is uh, what's known as the RPSA, a, a, an incentive to accelerate uh, achievement of renewable portfolio, goal, uh, portfolio goals. So if the utility can uh, exceed the current uh, uh, corrected formula for renewables in each year where they exceed that formula, the first two years they're gonna uh, earn, it's called a $20 a megawatt hour adder on top of um, uh, for any generation above that. So a very, very strong incentive for bringing on all the current projects in the timelines uh, in the queue that have been delayed. We've put a, a greater uh, 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 incentive for projects coming online in the first two years. So we're trying to bring on as much these new projects as we can uh, during our recovery period and uh, support uh, that recovery period with new clean energy jobs. So we've, we've put a greater emphasis on the near term achievement of this uh, incentive, but overall, uh, really for the first time, it will align uh, Hawaiian Electric, the ability to earn a profit on non-utility owned projects, which are by and large the ones that we uh, see for both utility scale and uh, uh, customer owned projects. And we believe this will, pro again, provide a strong incentive to align uh, interconnection and bringing these projects online. Just as a quick rundown, the other incentive mechanisms will allow for uh, 
uh, faster acquisition of grid services contracts, uh, faster interconnection. Uh, a uh, innovative one that I want to thank our staff and Commissioner Potter for leading. And this is one to um, provide greater incentive for collaboration between Hawaii Energy and Hawaii, uh, and Hawaii Electric for achieving energy efficiency savings for low to moderate income customers. Uh, we have, we've also included an incentive mechanism to uh, increase the pace of grid modernization. So uh, the details of that are in the decision and some of the summary documents. Last two areas I want to touch on are we've also included safeguards in this for both customers. Uh, and the utility. And so uh, if we find that um, the outcomes are kind of getting to the extreme range, commission can reopen and look at different provisions of the framework. Uh, there's automatic sharing provisions if uh, we find the utilities rev uh, returns are too high or too low. This provides uh, safeguards for everyone. And one area that hasn't been uh, emphasized as much in the public discussion, we've also included a, a new innovation framework a more flexible framework for Hawaiian Electric to, be, uh, to bring pilot project proposals to the commission. This was uh, modeled largely after the framework that exists in Vermont for Green Mountain Power, which has been an industry leading uh, framework and, and series of projects that they've had there from as far as we could tell. We've adopted that for Hawaii. So some of Aki's projects would fall under this. Mitch, right before we taught, started here, talked about uh, uh, in a, a pilot rate for hydrogen, uh, Arizona Power just proposed something like that to their commission. So we we we're we're trying to make a, a more flexible, faster pathway for those ideas to come before our commission and go into implementation. I want to emphasize that. Uh, so I'll leave. That's the uh, summary of our PBR decision. I do want to highlight uh, the end of last year was an extremely intense time in our commission. A few days before we issued the PBR decision, we extended the disconnection moratorium for utility customers. A few days after that, uh, we approved three of the, first, the phase two projects, two of the grid services contracts. At the end of the year, we approved on an interim basis a new agreement with Hawaii Gas and PAR, uh, as well as dealt with a lot of the, a, a number of the outstanding COVID related requests. So that the last two years was. Uh, pretty intense time. Our staff worked uh, incredibly hard, so I want to thank you again. Looking ahead, a few areas I want to touch on. Uh, one thing that we've worked actually very hard on internally in the past year is a new strategic plan. Uh, our, our action steps for implementing that are online, uh, and we're working on that in this year. We're also working, and uh, we've asked a number of you to give feedback on this, but we're updating our docket management system, our DMS, uh, so that bid is out right now. And so that'll be a, a couple year project, but we've, we're have we looking to update and overhaul that system. That's gonna uh, significantly improve our interactions with all of you. Uh, looking ahead, all of our phase two projects uh, and including KIUC's project, uh, CBR, uh, so phase two projects for Hawaiian Electric for CBRE, utility scale projects. These are higher on a priority list to continue. Uh, a number of times today, I've heard references uh, to the DER docket. This is our next major investigative docket that we'll look to push forward on this year. Uh, we've worked on a, a new strategic plan and initiatives with Hawaii Energy and their COVID response plan. So we'll look forward to the, the next year. Uh, the implementation of this new framework will be front and center in the next six months. And uh, since it was a topic already and not far down the list, but uh, we'll continue to monitor and deal with emergencies overall, and the, the as well as the overall COVID response across all the utilities. Um, we've had a lot that made the news, but we have some others, some smaller companies that don't quite make the news, um, but they're things that the commission needs to act on immediately and demand our attention. So that's the quick rundown. Thanks, Scott. Hopefully, let's see, the attendees are still up, so I didn't wear everyone down too much. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can handle any questions. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chair Griffin. Um, unfortunately, I think we're at the end of time. Um, oh, perfect. So you you not only you not only wore everyone down, you ran out the clock. Um, so uh, thank you, though, very much for providing us with uh, so much detail about the work that you've been up to. 
um, and the hard work that the Public Utilities Commission has done to help Hawaii respond to the coronavirus and position Hawaii for economic recovery. Um, I also, just as a closing comments, would like to thank our speakers and audience members for spending your afternoon with us. We can't stress enough the value that folks like yourselves bring to this process, to Hawaii achieving its uh, energy goals. It was quite an ambitious agenda we had today with some excellent presentations. And I know it will provide a good foundation for the upcoming legislative session. I'd also like to just say a few thank yous, especially to Maria Tomei and Kirsten Turner here at the Energy Office for doing so much of the heavy lifting to bring this together. Um, I'd like to reiterate how honored we are to work uh, with Senator Wakai and Representative Lowen with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and especially Mitch Ewan for helping us out with the Q&A, um, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute for helping to uh, sponsor this and Think Tech Hawaii for bringing all your technical expertise and personal presentation training uh, to everyone and our many partners who also helped put on this important event. Uh, we look forward to working with you all throughout this and we have our fingers crossed that we will be able to see each other in person this time next year. Mahalo Nui everyone and have a great weekend.